Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Starship Troopers lore, where today we are going to be having a look at the Terran Federation, or the United Citizens Federations, depending upon whether you're going by the books or the movie. In this one, we will be going primarily by the book, since it is the one that delved into the most detail about the Federation, its laws, its traditions, its philosophies, and its ways of thinking. Though we'll mix in a little bit from the movies here and there as well. As is fast becoming the modus operandi with Starship Troopers lore videos, this will be the one in which we examine the lore as it is written. And a little bit of speculation here and there, since some of the parts are not entirely clear, shall we say. Then, a bit later on, I will release a second video where we will discuss a lot of the ideas of the Federation, its philosophy, flaws, benefits, inconsistencies, and whether or not it could be applicable to our modern day civilizations. And speaking of the modern day, I do have a quick little shill to make here as well. I have activated the YouTube membership function, where you can sign up for a recurring cost of $5 per month as a way of supporting me. Currently, the only real benefit is that you get one day early access to the lore videos, so you get them on Thursday instead of Fridays, the exact same reward as offered for Patreon or Subscribestar. You will also get access to a series of custom emojis and badges that can be used on YouTube, in the chat and the comment section and so on. I've primarily chosen to activate this now because YouTube is getting ever crazier with the mid-roll ads and I would not blame anyone for turning on ad blocks these days. But if you still want to give me a little bit of support then this is another way to do so. Anywho. Enough shilling, moving on with the Terran Federation, the governing body of Earth and all her planets. At the point when Johnny Rico signs up for his federal service in the mobile infantry, the Terran Federation is an interplanetary limited democracy, where only those who have completed at least two years of federal service, or as much longer as the needs of the Federation demands, can wield the sovereign franchise, run for political office, and vote in elections. Furthermore, you will notice the use of the phrase completed federal service there. As long as an individual is still engaged in some form of federal service, be it in the military, the navy, the canine corps, games and theory, or any other of the myriad ways in which one can complete one's service, the individual is not allowed to vote. Only those who have proven through a completed term that they are willing and able to take on the responsibility of serving, protecting and sacrificing for the body politics are allowed to wield the ultimate authority of the franchise, through which they guide and affect the direction and actions of the Federation. That is um, quite the radical departure from the essentially unlimited democracy of our modern day where for the vast majority of citizens the only restriction placed upon whether or not one is allowed to vote or run for political office is an arbitrary age limit. And once you are past that point, barring a handful of circumstances like criminal convictions in some cases for example, you are allowed to do whatever you want with what is essentially more political power than 99% of humanity has ever enjoyed throughout the entirety of human history. You may even, if you wish to do so, completely and utterly ignore it. We are going to talk more about federal service later, what it means to serve, what benefits a citizen has that a civilian has not, and about the laws and philosophies of the Federation, but let us first deviate a little bit and go all the way back to the beginning, and explore how we ended up with a Terran Federation in the first place. Now, no one knows precisely how the earliest building blocks of what was to become the Terran Federation were created. 
It started with something called Veterans Councils, but we need to go back long before that again to truly see the root of it all. Near the end of the 20th century, the North American Republic collapsed. It is heavily suggested that this was due to large-scale rioting, general unrest and upheaval within American society. Eventually, after having broken up into several component parts, an alliance formed between the various American states, presumably, that then allied with the United Kingdom, who in turn, also experiencing huge civil unrest and upheavals, allied with Russia in an attempt to create a Western powers sphere of influence, including, presumably, Europe. But we don't hear anything about it explicitly. It is entirely possible that the entirety of Europe had at that point essentially devolved into an anarchist mess. This left, then, the Western powers in the form of the Russo-Anglo-American Alliance, which was opposed in the East by the Chinese hegemony. The world was split into two competing spheres of influence. Hardly a recipe for peace at the best of times, and then you add in worldwide unrest and civil upheaval, with every government on the face of the planet needing some way to unify their people. Hmm. Well, nothing unifies a populace quite like a common enemy. It is the oldest play in the book and has been repeated throughout human history ad nauseum. Indeed, one might easily argue that we are in the middle of a repeat of this age-old tactic right now. The problem with this approach, however, is that the longer you demonize your enemy, the more strident the demands will eventually become to do something, do anything. And so, in 1987, with the inevitability of icebergs shifting, the two power blocks entered into a state of war with one another. What follows is a period of over a century, with very, very little firm information. The various governments of the world had already begun to disintegrate at this early point, their hold over their people slipping day by day. Throw in the inescapable deprivations of war, starvation, disorder, increase in rampant criminal activity, and an explosion in the size of the black market brought about by ever harsher restrictions and rationing, and you've got a recipe for disaster. People were genuinely and legitimately afraid of leaving their houses during the night, lest they be assaulted or molested by bands of roaming criminals and delinquents. If anything, it was a damned miracle the nations of old Earth managed to hang on for a century before starting to collapse in full. But the mounting unrest could only be contained for so long. Right before the end of the war, the Western powers were victim to a massive coup d'etat, an event later referred to as the Revolt of the Scientists. Apparently, the intellectual class had made lofty promises, and gathered behind them, one would presume, considering they did succeed in seizing power, at least for a short amount of time significant elements of both the civilian populace and the army. They promised that if you allowed the educated elite to run things, then you would have utopia. It turned out that the intelligentsia's idea of utopia was something much along the lines of Plato's Republic. Or, as the teacher in History and Mora Philosophy in the book puts it, the misleadingly named Plato's Republic. A full analysis of that piece of philosophical madness is well outside the scope of this video, but I do suggest you go look it up and you'll swiftly come to see why no one would want to live in that particular society.
And it turns out that once the civilian populace and the military learned what the learned men really had in store for them, they swiftly deposed the coup makers. But the damage had already been done. Much like Russia in the First World War, the Western powers now began to buckle beneath the pressure of external and internal enemies. The Western powers were shortly thereafter forced to sign a humiliating peace treaties that gave up massive concessions to the Chinese hegemony and officially ended the war in 2130. Now I have heard it said that a bad peace is still better than a good war, but... <laughs> It is, like many, war is universally bad argument, hopelessly naive. One needs look no further than post-World War I Germany to put the lie to such a notion. And the Treaty of New Delhi was, if anything, even worse. The Western nations were already teetering on the brink of disintegration. Between them, the revolt of the scientists and the dishonorable peace at New Delhi delivered at last the firm kick to send the whole rotting structure crashing into a million pieces. Civilized society collapsed. Governments disbanded, currency inflation hit historic highs, and law and order became little more than a fairy tale. On the bright side of things, people were no longer quite as afraid of going outside at night. Instead, they were more afraid of being burned to death inside of their houses when the next round of looting and pillaging kicked off. And it was in these dark times that the very first glowing embers of what would eventually become the Terran Federation began to appear. The first confirmed known instance happened in Aberdeen, Scotland, where a small group of veterans, having returned from the war greatly dissatisfied by the peace treaty and granted nothing for their sacrifices, the state that had promised to take care of them and their families once they'd served their terms and fought like their duty demanded, had collapsed. There was no pay, there was no services, no veterans' homes, no infrastructure or logistics at all. Those returning veterans that were lucky enough to have family to rely upon would either have to do so, live on the streets, or cut into whatever meager savings they might have set aside for a rainy day. They were, <laughs> to put it quite mildly, not particularly happy with the situation. And what do you think happens next, when you have large numbers of disappointed and dissatisfied fighting men returning, often with their weapons, to a society in complete disintegration? They either join in the looting and the pillaging, relying upon their military experience and weaponry to shoot right to the top of the new anarchist hierarchy, or they move in to their local communities, their cities, their towns, and decide to do something about the disorder. And that is what happened in Aberdeen, Scotland. A group of veteran vigilantes got together, and with a mix of threats of violence, and outright violence, demanded that all of the rioting, the pillaging, and the burning cease. We do not know precisely what happened next, but we do know how it ended. The veterans managed to restore law and order, and as a demonstration of just how serious they were, they hung a number of individuals, including two veterans, who had presumably chosen the former option upon returning home. Now granted, I would agree that hanging people for looting and rioting seems a trifle harsh, but considering the circumstances, perhaps not. And again, the veteran vigilantes wished to send a message. 
They were not interested in having to break up every riot, hunt down every hoodlum, or punish every criminal. They wished for the hangings themselves to help put an end to the violence. And it did so successfully. In fact, over the next few months or weeks, the news spread that, strangely, this small area of Scotland near Aberdeen was quite peaceful. Law and order seemed to still reign in this small portion of Scotland, whilst the rest of the world was on fire. Why? They began asking themselves. Why this one area? And as they began to learn the answers, they swiftly began emulating the actions of the veteran vigilantes. In turn, the originals soon began to get in contact with their copycats, and they were not at all irritated by the fact that someone else had taken their solutions and implemented it. Quite the contrary, they were overjoyed. This proved that there were others out there who were both willing and able to take responsibility for the safety of their own communities. They began to talk together, they began to come up with common solutions, and they began to further codify a set of actions that they could all agree upon. This meant, though, that the ad hoc organizational structure, if structure is even the correct name, of the original veteran vigilantes was no longer up to the task. It had simply just been a group of random hodgepodge individuals who had come together to do what they felt and thought was right and necessary. This had been fine for keeping control of a few city blocks here and there, but now that they were expanding and getting in contact with other groups, they needed a more properly stratified hierarchy and so they established what would become known as the Veterans Councils. And these newly organized de facto governing bodies were not, as the name clearly implies, open to just anyone. Only veterans might participate. Civilians and politicians need not apply. This would later on evolve into a philosophy, an idea, a peculiar reason for why this was to be the case. But at this early point in the embers of the Federation's history, it was for no such grand or idealistic ideal. The veterans simply didn't like the civilians or the political class. They viewed the politicians as the scummy, slimy, corrupt bastards that had first sent them to war and then refused them the ability to win that war. And the civilians were little better, yellow-bellied scum who stayed home safe and secure beneath their blankets, and when chaos came to their doorstep, Once more, they simply just shoved their heads in the sands and did nothing, waiting for real men to come back and deal with things. No, if the veterans were going to take care of things as they were, then they would have no pencil pushers or civilians looking over their shoulders, questioning their decisions, their actions, or their morals. I'm sure a fair few of the civilian class may have looked upon the veterans' councils with deep suspicion, at the very least at first. Really, a group of returned war veterans, brutish, violent, angry men, have now created for themselves a government in which they are the only voices that matter, and the only guarantee we have that they will not abuse their own power is their word, their pledge that they will police their own? Hmm, yes. I'm sure many have heard much the same throughout history. But these were exceptionally dark times, and when people fear for their property, their lives, their very security, they tend to not ask too many difficult philosophical questions of the men moving in to restore that safety. 
And despite many well-founded fears, the new system turned out to work remarkably well. They began opening up their own ranks to new veterans, they actively policed their own, and they brought what people most desired during those times, stability and order. Eventually, the solution spread, and on some occasions even simply occurred naturally, with other groups of veterans coming to the same conclusion as those in Aberdeen, that something had to be done, and that there was no point in sitting about waiting for somebody else to do it. Eventually, the veterans' councils themselves grew obsolete. Not because they'd fallen out of favour, or because people no longer appreciated their solutions. Quite the opposite, they had grown too small to bear the burden of the administrative duties placed upon them. And that was the point at which they declared the formation of the Terran Federation, and began rebuilding the nations of the world. And yes, by the way, there are still nations in Starship Troopers. At least, it sounds that way. Uh, Johnny Rico mentions in passing that many of the nations of Earth have a relatively low percentage of citizens compared to some of the outer colonies, for example. Now clearly, they are all subject to Terran Federation authority, law, and federal service, but they do still exist, perhaps in some capacity like, say, states in the US of A. Now then, I have told you about how the Terran Federation came to be, at least I've told you as much as the book gives us reason to infer anyways, so let's move on to some of the other topics as well. Let us begin with one of the more interesting ones, the idea of morality in Starship Troopers. And this is a very big part of Heinlein's universe. The Terran Federation places a great deal of value on morality, and it considers itself to be a moral entity. Every single child undergoing schooling in the Terran Federation is required to take lessons in history and moral philosophy, lessons that must always be taught by a veteran of federal service. Now, the children do not need to pass this class, they do not get tested in it and there are no marks whatsoever. Those who have entered into federal service within the mobile infantry, games and theory, the K-9 Corps or the Navy though, that wish to become commissioned officers must take what is essentially an advanced course in history and moral philosophy. And whilst again there are no marks, they must pass the course to their teacher's satisfaction. If the teacher gives them a down check, then they are put before a board, which will then begin to question whether or not you should be allowed to continue your training for commission, or if you should even be in the army at all. Which may seem harsh, but here's the thing. For the school children, the lessons in history and moral philosophy is the Terran Federation trying to explain to them what it is, why it is doing the things it is doing, the moral justification and the reasoning behind it. But it doesn't really care if they don't understand. They are just school children. They are just civilians after all. But in a commissioned officer, if they can't wrap their heads around what the Federation is and the rationale for its actions, <laughs> what the hell are you doing applying for a commission? It's pretty obvious that if you don't understand why the mobile infantry exists, you should not be allowed to lead it. But what is this reason for existence then? Why is the Terran Federation allowed to keep going and do what it does? Its goal, to put it quite simply, is exactly the same goal as any other form of human government throughout history. To provide stable and benevolent government. And as far as the Terran Federation is concerned, any form of government that achieves that is, by definition, a moral government. 
As for the reason why the Terran Federation continues to exist, instead of surrendering itself to some other theoretical utopian ideal, as we see in today's society with a certain ideology, for example, is quite simple. The Terran Federation works. As one teacher of history and moral philosophy put it, Personal freedom for all is greatest in history. Laws are few, taxes are low, living standards are as high as productivity permits, and crime is at its lowest ebb. That certainly does sound appealing, does it not? And because it works, the Terran Federation believes that it has a right to continue to function. But how does it achieve this? Well, it is the same reason why it continues to uphold the idea that only people who have completed their federal service is allowed the franchise. It is, to put it quite simply, a matter of duty and responsibility. This is also reflected in the Terran Federation systems of laws. We do not know too much about the legal system of the Federation, but it does contain a lot of corporal punishment, and a fair bit of death sentences as well. One example that is given in the book is also of progressive punishment. An error made by a private that gets him whipped could rate hanging for a lieutenant. An example is given with Johnny Rico. He cheats during a test. He pops up his optical vision equipment when he is supposed to be in simulated darkness within his suit. This gets him whipped. If a lieutenant had done the same then, it is possible that he may have been executed for something like that. Now, throughout the book, granted, the military personnel is presented as very reasonable people who probably wouldn't do that, but one could make the argument that is a little bit of an idealistic uh, representation of humanity. And so, in theory, something like that, cheating on a test, or, as the officers put it, potentially placing your squad in danger, could rate execution. They also mention whipping as a punishment for civilians. This is in relation to another uh, history and moral philosophy class taught to school children. One of them has a question. The teacher has mentioned that during the times of the disorder, the uh, dark days before the coming of the Terran Federation, there were gangs of violent young people roaming the streets, harassing, intimidating, and even outright assaulting people. The pupil is horrified at this idea and can't seem to quite comprehend how this could possibly have happened. Where were their parents? Where were the police, their teachers, etc? If, as the pupil mentions, he had done anything even half as bad, he would have gotten a beating from the teachers and then another beating when he got back home as punishment. And if someone were to actually do something that bad, you know, harassing people in the open, threatening them or assaulting them, the punishment would probably be for the parent to be whipped in public alongside the child. Now, immediately, I imagine some of you are recoiling in horror. Whippings? For that? Beatings? For disobedience? That seems rather extreme, and yes, in many ways it is. They also mention that again, corporal punishment is used in school. It is mentioned that the headmaster has not needed to schwack or rod a child for two years. Meaning that he does have the power to do so, but it is a very, very, very rare occurrence. The book makes a fair few arguments around this and how it is moral, how the unlimited democracies of the 21st and 20th century collapsed under the well-meaning but misguided rule of social workers and child psychologists. A better example for the modern age that we live in now might be the infantilization of society. 
People who are, shall we say, at an age where they should reasonably not be considered children anymore, are often coddled and treated as if they were still nothing more than an innocent child, free of any and all real agency of their own. It is also on occasion seen that people rely more and more on society, on the state for base necessities. Instead of going out and getting a job, people might choose to live off welfare, which, ridiculous as it sounds, in some cases will actually pay more than a job would. And this once more brings us back to the ideas of duty and responsibility. You have a duty to raise your child. Your child is your responsibility, ergo, if the child gets really out of hand, you will be expected to take punishment alongside the child because you will have failed as much, if indeed not more, than the child, because the parent is the one with the responsibility in that situation. That is also why a lieutenant might be punished far more harshly than a private, because he has far more responsibility. There is another aspect of this as well. The book suggests that anything that infringes upon other people's rights, their safety, their security, their freedoms, etc., is also treated extremely harshly. It is mentioned, for example, that kidnapping is also punished by hanging. Now, a kidnapping in and of itself, you know, that's no, no fun and games, absolutely, but does it warrant death? Well, in this society where each individual is expected to keep up his own duties, his own responsibilities, and has in return been granted near ultimate freedom, depriving someone of that freedom then is perhaps the gravest crime you could possibly commit. This idea of absolute freedom is also presented in another area of federal law surrounding service. It is your right to undergo federal service, regardless of any other factors. The example brought up in the book is when Johnny Rico asks one of the doctors poking and prodding him if they reject a lot of people for medical reasons, and the doctor tells him no. We are not legally allowed to reject anyone for medical reasons. If you come here in a wheelchair, blind and deaf, we would still have to accept you and we would still have to find something for you to do. He goes on to mention that literally the only way you might be refused federal service is if the psychologist deems that you can not understand the oath. And even beyond that point, should you be injured during the training? There is another example of this in the book, where one has a nasty injury during power armor training and becomes unable to walk. He is offered a medical discharge. He will not have completed his terms of service, but it will not be dishonorable, and he will be allowed to return to civilian society where he will be provided for by the state. He refuses. A legless man refuses his medical discharge, and the Terran Federation has no power to force him to take that discharge. And on the flip side, anyone undergoing federal service can at any point simply say, no, I do not want to be here anymore. Give me a blank piece of paper, I will make my mark on it, and I will leave federal service. There is only two exceptions to this. One is in the direct face of the enemy, and two if you are currently undergoing court martial, which, by the way, is one of the only ways in which the Federation can get rid of you. It is if a court martial sits on you and determines that you are unfit for service. This is also seen if a commissioned officer fails his history and moral philosophy class and might then also be discharged from the army. 
It may seem like I've gone on a little bit of a divergent tangent here on the idea of federal law and responsibility, but this is key to understanding, again, why the Terran Federation is of the opinion that it is a moral form of governance that should be continued, and also why it believes that it has a scientifically proven idea of morals. To the Terran Federation, it is not mere theory or philosophy. They believe they have logical, mathematical proof that their government is the best form of government possibly available. And it is the combination of responsibility and duty. Federal service is a duty, but it is a voluntary one. It is not forced upon anyone, and it is extremely easy to quit, and it is very difficult to join up as well. Even if you've joined up and you've made the oath, the recruitment officer then tells you, do you know what happens if you don't show up after 48 hours to join the mobile infantry or whatever else you've been assigned? In the book, Johnny Rico asks, Court Martial? You'll, you'll come and find me, etc. And the recruitment officer just says, No, nothing. We will do absolutely nothing. All that will happen is that your recruitment will expire, and you will have been de facto discharged from the army, and you will have no further opportunity to apply for federal service. And that's it. They even mention that they make absolutely no effort whatsoever to track down deserters. Now, the very idea of deserting in and of itself is vaguely ridiculous, isn't it? You can sign a piece of paper at any point, at any time, for any reason, and you're out. Why bother deserting? But it does happen, and when it does, the mobile infantry, the army, the federation does not expend any resources in trying to find them. And the reason for that is that the Terran Federation believes, again, this is the reason why it thinks it has a mathematically proven, logical form of morality, that a person's power, a person's responsibility, needs to be matched up with a price, a sacrifice, or a cost. And therefore, if a person wishes to wield the ultimate power of the sovereign franchise and through it determine the course of the entirety of human civilization, he must have matched that power by risking the most important thing he can risk, namely, of course, his life and safety in the name of the Federation. He is asking for the ultimate authority in guiding the Federation, and therefore the Federation in turn asks that he be willing to commit the ultimate sacrifice for it. And the reason why this is defined as moral behavior is because the Federation defines moral behavior thusly. It is survival behavior above the level of the individual. In other words, any action you take to make sure that you are surviving and thriving is moral behavior. But since we are talking about government here, nations and voting, etc., moral behavior then necessarily must become any action you take on behalf of something that is not you, on behalf of the collective, on behalf of the state, the government, and all of those millions of people you will never know and you will never meet. This, the book then concludes, is the reason why the Terran Federation system works better than any other system, because it is moral, it is rooted in the base necessity for anyone, and a species particularly, to survive and thrive. And it states furthermore that whilst the veteran might fail in civic virtue here and there, he might not be as smart as the scientists, or he might not be as disciplined, etc. He may be a man of many flaws, but he has proven through lengthy, voluntary, and frequently very harsh training that he is willing to put the needs of the collective, the state, the government, the group, whatever you wish to call it, 
before his own immediate needs. And therefore, the book says, his average performance is incomparably better than any other class of voters throughout history. It is also the reason why the voluntary aspect is so very, very important. All important, in fact. After all, a sacrifice you are forced to make isn't much of a sacrifice. And it's probably going to engender you with a fair bit of resentment now, isn't it? But what precisely is federal service? We have talked about why the Federation does it now, but we haven't really delved into deep detail about what precisely it is. If you want to know more about the mobile infantry in particular, then I have already made a video on that, and you can find it on my channel, the Mobile Infantry, primarily related in that case to the movie. But Federal Service is more than just the Mobile Infantry, or just even the military services in general. As I've already gone over, there is the Mobile Infantry, the K-9 Corps, the Navy, and Games and Theory. Those are the primary branches. As mentioned, the Mobile Infantry has its own lore video, so go watch that if you're interested. The K-9 Corps is a rather interesting entity as well, where the people who join it are given a partner, a cyber dog. As one recruitment officer put it, a cyber dog is about as intelligent as a human moron, but that comparison is not fair to the cyber dog. For whilst the human moron is an aberration, a defect, the cyber dog is instead a stable genius amongst his own kind. Amongst other things, the dog can speak. The dog can understand human language, and it can make intelligent decisions to make for a near-perfect scout. And during training, the handler and the dog develop an incredibly strong bond. Perhaps I'll do a video on them at some point too. It'll probably be a relatively short one, because we don't know that much about them, but I do feel as if the concept deserves a little bit of further exploration, shall we say. Anywho, the other two, the Navy, that's rather self-explanatory. Space Navy, mind you, not, you know, water Navy. But beyond that, it does what you'd think a Navy would do in such a universe. It fights space battles whenever necessary, and it transports the mobile infantry and troops in general to whatever they are required. The final one, Games and Theory, is the Military Intelligence Branch. They are the guys that devise the secret operations and try to figure out what it is precisely that enemies are capable of, both in terms of warfare, planning, intelligence, etc. A vital, nearly indispensable in real -do reality, branch when it comes to warfare against non-humanoid species. After all, how are you going to find out what a species like the arachnids think? Why they do what they do? And if you can't figure out that, how could you possibly start figuring out what they might do next? But, besides these military services, they also mention several forms of non-military service. Now, it is described as a bit of a horror show by the recruitment officer, but I think that, at least in part, this is due to discourage the young recruits. It's rather interesting. When Johnny Rico goes to sign up, he originally does so only to support his friend Carl. Carl has been dreaming of joining up forever and wanted to be a scientist. Rico comes along to show a little bit of support and plans to not join up at all. But then Carmen Ibanez arrives, the hot chick. <laughs> and God knows... It is not the first time, nor will it be the last time, that a young man makes a rash decision in the presence of a lady. Carmen has decided to join up. She wants to join the Navy, and the recruitment officer is all smiles. You know, he shakes her hand and goes like, that's great, we always need more pilots, because the book states that females make for better pilots than men. But then he turns to Carl and Rico, and he scowls at them almost disgustedly, and he delivers them these absolute horror stories of what federal service could be like. 
This is in all due likelihood because the Terran Federation requires only certain things. Whilst you are allowed to write down your preferences, the placement officer is not required to humour your requests. He will take it into consideration, but he does not need to actually grant your wishes. If there is a need for mobile infantry, he'll place you in the mobile infantry. If there is a need for truck drivers driving long haul on Venus, how the hell that happens, I'm not entirely sure then that's what you're gonna do. That'll be your federal service. And they talk about how horrible it is, freezing your ass off, or being used as a human test subject and so on. Now, honestly, considering how harsh federal service is meant to be intentionally so, in fact, they outright state that it is made as harsh as possible to ensure that the person that is going through it is willing to do the sacrifice required of him, I do not think that this is really necessarily the service that they are talking about. This is a scare tactic. It is to make sure that the civilian actually wants to commit to the service. Though again, I'm sure such horrible forms of service is probably around somewhere. However, it appears that the military branches are the most glorious, or at least considered the most glorious, the most honourable and the most proper ways in which to conduct your service. And with the Terran Federation being on a war footing quite frequently, as it turns out that the galaxy is indeed a very large place inhabited by many unfortunate competitive species, it is also something that it's in constant demand. And again, the sheer rigours of the service undoubtedly means that it isn't going to be filling up anytime soon, even in peacetime. Of Johnny Rico's class of cadets, there were 2,009 men initially in his mobile infantry company. Only 187 of those graduated MI basics, with 14 dead and one executed. All of the rest either resigned, were dropped, or transferred out of the mobile infantry, usually via severe injury. That leads me on to another point as well. Whilst it is true that there are other branches of federal service beyond the military, it is also equally true that once you are in some form of military federal duty, you fight. Everyone fights. When a mobile infantry regiment carries out a drop, everyone is involved in it. The soldiers, the officers, the cooks, the maintenance people, even the general drops down right alongside his troops. I would not be at all surprised if even the truck drivers on some moon somewhere would be required to carry out some form of limited military training, presuming they're even capable of it, before being allowed to engage in that service. Now, there is some interesting little um, counterpoints there and arguments for and against it, even indeed made by the author himself, but I think we'll get over that in the more unserious episode, which we'll do at some point in the nearish future. As a mention of that whole training thing, though, mobile infantry training is extremely harsh, purposefully so. Again, they are trying to weed out the chaff. They are trying to maintain only a tiny, hard, elite core. And everyone else is basically forced to resign. Not in any such crass means. An officer doesn't go up to you and say, like, quit or I'll beat your ass or anything like that. They just keep beating their asses regardless. The NCOs, the drill sergeants, have a little stick, a rod of authority with which to hit the privates with at any time for any reason. Basically, you could go so far as to say that once you enroll in the Federation, all of those much terrorist rights you had as a civilian all fly right out the window. You are at that point de facto federal property, and the Federation and its officers may do with you precisely as they wish, and they will, up until the very instance 
that you are no longer in service, though this courtesy is also extended to off-duty personnel. So an officer out on the town, for example, can't simply just punch another private who he is off on the town at some form of liberty or pass. You know, that would be <laughs> perhaps a little bit too barbaric. Though to instantly provide you with a bit of a counterpoint to that, you remember how I said that the training was made as harsh as possible? Well, that's not enough either. It is mentioned at another point in the book, further illustrating that there are non-combat forms of federal service, when one of the teachers in history and moral philosophy once more state that there is no reason to suggest that the mobile infantry personnel, the, the veterans, the servicemen, those who have completed federal service, are better than other voters because they are picked men or because of their military service. Because, he mentions, in times of war, most discharged veterans will have belonged to non-combat auxiliary services. And they have, as the teacher puts it, merely been harassed, beaten, overworked, and endangered. Not exposed to the full cruelties then, apparently, of military service. And endangered as well, that is on purpose. You are purposefully put in danger in your training. Again, to make sure that you are willing, not just theoretically, but in reality, to risk your life. The perfect example of this is live fire exercises. Whilst the mobile infantry are training their recruits, they conduct drills, they conduct simulated warfare, where they fire blanks at one another, and drill instructors walk around pointing out casualties here and there, and also using stuff like laser designators, probably. But, out of every 500 rounds of blank ammunition, there is one single live round. Now, that is not as dangerous as it might at first sound. One live round out of 500 rounds of simulated ammo. The odds of that ever hitting anyone is pretty goddamn rare. And medical technology has advanced to the point that Anything but a direct headshot splattering your brains out is unlikely to kill you or even permanently cripple you. Furthermore, it is considered, of course, bad sport to purposefully aim for someone's head during these simulated combats. But it does happen. That 500th lucky round does occasionally find itself a new home in someone's head. It absolutely is dangerous, but then again, living is dangerous. And you are asking to be granted the supreme in political authority, after all. Again, to receive that authority, you must be willing to put on the line everything you have, up to and including your life. There are also other charming little tests, like being dumped naked in the Canadian mountains, for example, and being expected to survive for a week or two. Make no mistake, there is a lot of actual genuine danger in mobile infantry and federal service, and it is absolutely intentional. A further point I should touch upon as well is the idea of female and male servicemen. In the movie, you are shown fairly mixed units where everyone is allowed to serve and they serve alongside one another. Whereas in the book, whilst it again makes clear that both men and women have the exact same rights to sign up and serve the Federation, there is seemingly not a single mention of a female in the mobile infantry. Early on, there is a rumour that there was a woman in another company in another camp somewhere, <laughs> but whether or not that was fact, or merely just barrack rooms gossip, is never really explained. Part of the reason for this, in all due likelihood, is, as mentioned, the Terran Federation believes that women make better pilots and navy personnel than they do grunts. And whilst the placement officer, once more, will take your preference into consideration, he is not required to actually place you in the branch of service that you wish. 
One should probably also take into consideration that the book was of course written in 1959. <laughs> long before any of this uh, modern nonsense became ever so popular. And that, then, is just about everything you need to know about the Terran Federation. And so I will wrap the video up here. Until next time, I have been Arch, as always, thank you very much for watching, if you enjoyed it, please do consider leaving behind a like and a comment, and maybe even sharing the video around to fellow enthusiasts of Starship Troopers. Until next time, have a good day.